It is now time for a question period. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, we're once again hearing of a slowdown in Europe and the broader glo global economy. This global instability threatens the economy of Ontario, making it even more important that we have a fiscal plan. Well, Ontarians heard about the Premier's plan this past weekend in Windsor. There were plans for an Ontario pension plan, for infrastructure, for taxing and spending. But, Mr. Speaker, do you know what was not in the Premier's plan? A plan for balancing the budget. So my question is, when will the Premier finally decide to make balancing the budget a priority for this government? Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the party opposite continues on a path of talking down Ontario, of not believing in Ontario's future, of not understanding that we have to do all of the above, Mr. Speaker. We have to make the investments that are going to allow our economy to thrive. That means investment in people's talent and skills. It means investments in infrastructure. It means partnering with business. And yes, it means making sure that people have retirement security. And at the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have a plan to balance the books, to make sure that we eliminate the deficit by 2017-18. That's why we have a president of the Treasury Board, Mr. Speaker. That's why we are making sure that we follow our plan, including optimizing our assets. The, the uh, member opposite, Mr. Speaker, Speaker should pay close attention to the plan that we took to the people of Ontario. I'm uh, going to immediately remind members that uh, when somebody's answering, there is no heckling on this side. I'll shorten the, question, uh, the answer, and on this side, I'll shorten the question. I'm also going to start immediately talking to individual members that have decided they want to jump right in. I will too. Supplementary. Whatever investments are being made, they're clearly not producing results. This government continues to set targets which are never being met. Look at the facts. With a debt Minister of Economic Development, come to order. The deficit approaching $12.5 billion and a budget that actually increases spending. Minister of Agriculture, come to order. It's hard to understand how this government intends to balance the budget by 2017 18. With the federal government about to balance their budget, yep. Ontario's deficits yep. accounts for more than two thirds of all of the deficits of all of the provinces in Canada. Shame. My question is simple. When will the budget deficit finally become a priority for this government? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, well, the elimination of the deficit is absolutely a priority for us, Mr. Speaker, but I, you know, the, uh, the member opposite neglects to mention that one of the ways that the federal government is balancing its books is on the backs of the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. Since 2009, Ontario has created over 514,000 new jobs. Mr. Speaker. That's right. That's exactly right. 24, 24,700 net new jobs in September, Mr. Speaker, and that's an increase of 19,100 full-time jobs. Youth employment has increased by 12,000. 600 jobs, Mr. Speaker. Our recovery yes, is sir. on track, and we are not going to eliminate the deficit on the backs of another level of government, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. No one actually believes that old rhetoric about the federal government. The fact is, they're doing quite well, and Ontario's lagging behind most of the other provinces in Canada. And the truth is, this government does not have a realistic plan for balancing the budget. Well, let's take a look at what the Conference Board of Canada says. Even if the government manages to achieve their ambitious spending control plan announced in the budget, the Conference Board projects that the province will fall about $2.4 billion short of reaching its balanced budget goal in 2017-18. Uh -oh, the facts are clear. Mr. Speaker, how can Ontarians have any credibility in this government when it comes to balancing the budget and managing debt? Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, in some ways, it's not surprising that the member opposite would be in favour of what the federal government is doing, including um, making Ontario, hitting Ontario to the tune of $641 million this year when, when other provinces were confronting the same issues. They didn't make that choice, Mr. Speaker. So, so that is, that's what the federal government is doing. The other thing is, Mr. Speaker, when that party was in office, they made it a habit of downloading services, downloading costs onto the backs of the municipal level of government, Mr. Speaker. We're in the process. 
process of uploading those calls. The election that we all just went through was actually about whether investing Answer. in the economy, investing in the future of the province was the way we wanted to go in this province, or whether cutting and slashing, which is what they brought to the people of Thank Ontario. You. Mr. Speaker, on June 12, the choice Thank was made, you. and we're in. Thank you. <clears throat> New question? The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My second question is also to the Premier. Over the past two years, Premier, the Standing Committee on Public Accounts conducted its investigation into the Orange Air Ambulance scandal. Prior to the election, the Public Accounts Committee signed off on a report that summarized the work and findings of the committee over that two-year period. Unfortunately, the legislature was dissolved before the report could be tabled. Premier, tomorrow the Standing Committee on Public Accounts will meet for the first time since the election. Will you direct your members to allow that report to be tabled. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the uh, government House Leader will want to speak to uh, to the supplementary. But, Mr. Speaker, I think it is very important that the committees get up and running. I think it's very important that the committees be allowed to do their work, Mr. Speaker. And the reports that were uh, that were not able to be released because the uh, the opposition decided that it was time for an election, Mr. Speaker, we need to get on with that work, and the committees will uh, will do just that. Yeah. Well, I, I failed to hear a clear answer there. On May 30th, Ontarians learned that Orange Air Ambulance Service had been charged with 17 offences under the Canadian Labour Code. The offences cited in the 17 charges were committed under your Deputy Premier's watch and under the watch of senior executives in the board at Orange. Premier, whether your minister accepts responsibility for failing in her oversight is one thing, but completely sidelining a report that could prevent future tragedies and mismanagement is unacceptable. Will you commit today very clearly to allow that report to be tabled, or will you keep this information secret from the people of Ontario in order to protect your own political interests? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the for the question. I think when it comes to the the secrecy of, of that report, I think, I think a former member of that party unfortunately really uh, leaked that report anyway. Anyways, at, at some point, Speaker, as you know, the committees have been formed uh, by this House. The committees are uh, starting this week, uh, uh, starting to commence their work, uh, elect their chairs and, and vice chairs, and will be up to the members of the committee to determine their work plan and uh, to determine what. Stop the clock. Member from Holloman, and uh, Norfolk will withdraw. Thank you. Carry on, please. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, as I was saying, it's up to the, the committee, uh, committee members to determine their work plan and uh, determine the, uh, the kind of uh, steps they will be taking. And if they choose to, uh, to uh, work on the report that was the, the former Standing Committee on Public Accounts was doing and release the information, I, I leave it up to the committee members. Thank you. Thank Final you. supplementary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think it's really important that Ontarians know that they cannot hide behind the structure of these committees, that the members of the committee, the Liberal members of the committee, can be directed to release that report. And clearly we're hearing that's not going to happen. And it's outrageous. We owe it to the frontline responders here, to the pilots, the paramedics, and the dispatchers at Orange who came forward. And most of all, we owe it to the people of Ontario who depend on our air ambulance service to be there when they need it. And we need this report to be tabled and these recommendations to be adopted. So finally, again, Premier, will you please direct the members of this committee to release this report, which is vital to the safety and the interests of the people of Ontario? Uh, speaker, when it, when, it comes to, when it comes to taking actions on the issues around Orange, I want to commend the former Minister of Health and Long-Term Care for her uh, uh, incredible work on that, on that matter in the previous parliament. Uh, when the issues came to light, she was uh, forthright, she was forthcoming, she brought information forward, she took immediate action uh, when it comes to changing the governance stru uh, structure of Orange and bringing it forward, in fact, a piece of legislation that will ensure that those type of issues does not take place. In addition, Speaker, uh, you know, the government fully cooperated with uh, the former Committee on, on Public Accounts in making information available so that committee members can do their work, and it will be up 
uh, to the new committee members when, as they assemble to determine uh, what steps, next steps to take, um, and uh, it will be up to them uh, to determine the time frame around when uh, and how they want to make their report available. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. What private companies have approached the government to buy up our shared public assets like our local hydro utilities? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So um, let me just uh, let me just say that I am very appreciative. We are very appreciative of the work that uh, Ed Clark and his council have done. Um, we said in our budget and then in our uh, platform when we ran in the election, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to make sure that the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario were working at their full value, yeah. so we could optimize the uh, the benefits to the people of Ontario and reinvest reinvest the money that, uh, that would come from that optimization into the infrastructure and into the assets that we need in 2014 and going forward, Mr. Speaker. So that, that is the advice that is coming forward from, uh, from Mr. Clark. And, uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, I think that it is only responsible and sensible to review the assets that are owned by the people of the province on a yes, regular sir. basis. That's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. And I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's actually irresponsible that the leader of the third party would not agree that that Thank was a you. good thing to do. Speaker, I'm going to try again. Can the Premier tell Ontarians exactly what Ontario, Canadian and foreign investors have approached her Liberal government about buying our shared public assets like our hydro utilities? Well, Mr. Speaker, since the, since the interim report has not even been completed yet, Mr. Speaker, and since we haven't even responded fully to what Mr. Clark and his council are suggesting, then no, I cannot do that, Mr. Speaker, because we have to make sure that we take responsible and uh, practical steps forward and to, to, pre to preempt the process before the report is even finalized would again be an irresponsible action that the leader of the third party is proposing. Yeah. Speaker, since we know what Liberals are like, perhaps I should ask how much in profits the Premier is dangling in front of energy speculators like banks and investment firms when she's trying to entice them to buy our shared public assets like hydro utilities. You know, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> What we, are, what we are trying to do is we are trying to make sure that we make the investments today that are necessary for our economic growth, that will benefit Order. future generations. And it, you know, it seems to me, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the third party ought to be, although she never has been, but she ought to be supportive of investments in transit, Mr. Right. Speaker, yeah. in roads and bridges across the province. I would have thought that those kinds of investments are the kinds of things that uh, the third party would be interested in. I would have thought, Mr. Speaker, that the third party would have understood that to make sure that we have those investments available to us, that we invest in the future of the province, is in the best interest of the economy, not just of today, not just job creation today, which it absolutely does, but for the future so that Ontario can thrive. Answer. Apparently, that kind of responsible, sensible path is not what the leader of the third party supports. Thank you. Speaker, my Speaker next question party. is also for the Premier. Can the Premier tell Ontarians whether she has engaged private legal and investment firms to help her with privatizing and selling off our hydro, hydro utilities, and if so, who they may be? So underpinning, um, underpinning the questions that the leader of the third party is asking is an assumption that anyone who works, anyone in government who works with the private sector in any way is somehow tainted, that somehow government and the private sector should never work together, even though the NDP signed contracts with private companies to generate power in the province, even though even though her own members are interested in extending those contracts, Mr. Speaker, and I have a quote that I will, uh, I will read shortly, but I don't buy into the notion that somehow government cannot work with the private sector. I just don't buy that. I believe that the practical Answer. way of governing is to work with all stakeholders, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that private, government, labour, that we all work together in Thank the you. best interest of the people of Ontario. Supplementary. 
Well, Speaker, clearly it's the Liberals who are tainted. You only need to look at orange in the gas plant scandal, yeah. Speaker. That's the problem the opposition has with the way this government deals with the private sector. Look, as the Premier knows, Ed Clark is still the CEO of the TD Bank. So I want to ask is, will the TD Bank be involved in the privatization or the purchase of our public assets like our hydro utility, Speaker? Thank you, Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, let me, uh, let me just go back again to uh, the point that I was making. So, our commitment is to unlock the value of the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario. That's what we said we were going to do in our budget, that's what we said we were going to do in our plan, and that's what we're doing. Um, the NDP is, uh, is basically saying that we should not work in any way with the private sector, and yet, and yet when they were government, they signed nine private power generating contracts wow. over a five-year span, totaling over 400 megawatts of power, Mr. Speaker. They made that, they made that commitment. Now, even her own MPPs don't agree with her, as I said, Mr. Speaker. So the NDP MPP for Temiskaming Cochrane has written to the Minister of Energy to encourage the OPA Answer. to renew the contract for a pow private power generator in his riding. So there are members in the NDP who are practical, Thank Mr. You. Speaker. There are members in the NDP who understand that working Thank with you. the private sector. Final supplementary. Once, Speaker, this Premier has been insisting that she isn't privatizing anything. She's ex insisting that there isn't a sell off, Speaker. But last Friday, Ed Clark made it clear that the plan is to privatize and sell off local hydro utilities. Now, instead of being uh, run for the public good, for those utilities to be run in a way that makes life more affordable for everyday families and helps create jobs, they'll instead be run to make maximum profits for speculators. Why does the Premier think that privatized hydro is good for Ontario families and businesses? Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane is sitting right beside the leader of the, of the third party, Mr. Speaker. Maybe she should just turn to her left and ask him why he's encouraging the Minister of Energy to extend the private power contract that is in his riding, Mr. Speaker. The fact. The member from Timmins, James Bay, will come to order. I think you knew that was coming. It, it must actually be very hard for the leader of the third party to ask these questions. She knows that we're not selling off the assets. She knows perfectly well that that was one of the parameters, Mr. Speaker, as Ed Clark went into this review. She knows that we are keeping these assets in public hands, and yet she continues to ask questions to undermine any relationship that the government might have with the private sector as though somehow that's not a good thing. She knows, Mr. Speaker, that her own Thank government, you. when they were in office, had to Thank take you. those practical steps. Thank you. New question, the member from Renfrew, Nipperson, Pembroke. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, last summer I rose in this House and demanded that the Justice Committee be allowed to continue its work investigating the serious wrongdoing in your gas plant scandal. Summer has turned to fall, and the fact remains that this scandal is ongoing and requires further investigation. This is not about documents having been released to the committee. This is not about previous witnesses who have testified. This is about how the committee needs to hear from Laura Miller and Peter Feist, two people who have agreed to testify and are at the very centre of this criminal investigation. Premier, it's time to stop talking about openness and transparency. It is time to demonstrate it by allowing us to interview and depose Laura Miller and Peter Feist. Questions? Will you commit to that to this House today? Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And again, I thank the member opposite uh, for the question. And I think I remind uh, the member opposite uh, that uh, the Premier has been uh, very transparent and accountable when it comes to uh, issues around the work that the Justice Committee uh, was, uh, was doing. Uh, Premier, uh, since she became the, the leader, uh, made sure that hundreds of thousands of documents were provided to the Justice Committee so the Justice Committee.
committee can do its uh, work. The Justice Committee has been meeting for about two and a half uh, years. They have, they have been, uh, they've listened to about 90 witnesses. And during the last campaign, uh, Speaker, the Premier made it very clear that she wants the Justice Committee to complete its work by, by engaging in report writing so they can provide recommendations to the government uh, around uh, record management, around siting of large energy infrastructure. And we look forward to the Justice Committee completing its work, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. To the Premier. Premier, I'm disappointed that you would pass that off to the House. Lee, this is a serious matter. You realize that by refusing to do the right thing, it proves that your statements about transparency and openness are nothing but lip service. This is the same old Liberal Party that it's always been. We need to ask Laura Miller and Peter Feist some serious questions about a serious criminal matter. What about the deleted emails, the destroyed documents, and the unauthorized access to the Premier's office? Premier, the people have the right to see this matter investigated fully. Laura Miller and Peter Feist have said they will testify before the committee. There is only one person standing in the way of the truth in this investigation, and Premier, that is you. Premier, I'm asking you once again to live up your rhetoric. One last chance, and let us finally get the answers about who is responsible for this gas plant scandal. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take a moment to remind members uh, we address each other either by our writing or title, and I'll be strict on that. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, uh, oh, Speaker, yeah. uh, the, the Premier has been absolutely clear. Uh, she wants Justice Committee to complete its work during the campaign. The Premier uh, asked uh, frequently, uh, restated her position that it is time after years of, uh, of, uh, of questioning about 90 uh, witnesses looking at hundreds and thousands of, of documents, it is time that the Justice Committee engage in report writing. Uh, Speaker, uh, we will be, we, uh, the Justice Committee will be resuming its work so that they can, they can complete their, uh, uh, their, uh, their report writing. Uh, even, uh, even the third party, Speaker, brought a motion um, in, in, in the committee asking that it's time to engage in, in, in report writing. So we very much looking forward uh, to their work so that so the government can have the information uh, in terms Answer. of uh, yeah, recommendations yeah. around siting of large infrastructure pro uh, projects and, and uh, document retention, and we're looking Thank forward you. to their work. Thank you. The member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Parapan Games. Speaker, there have been so many unanswered questions around the cost of security for these games. And just this morning, we've learned about a new RFP process that's raising even more questions. Sponsorships for the games are now being directly tied to the RFP for security. Speaker, what does a company's sponsorship of the games have to do with them being awarded such significant contracts as providing game security? Responsible for the games. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to uh, thank the member for the uh, question opposite. I know that uh, the government house leader would like to uh, answer the second part to it. But before I answer the question, I just want to say that the Lonely Planet uh, today announced that Toronto and Ontario is in the top 10 uh, destinations for 2015 because of the Pan Am Games. And I think we should all be proud of that. Yeah. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, we take our we take our security very very seriously here in the province of Ontario. We need to make sure that, as we plan for these games, that um, our security ensures the safety of all Ontarians and all visitors. And there's two different components of the security. There's the one held by the ISU, and there's one one also being held um, to support uh, the safety and uh, and the protection of property during the games. There's been a uh, an RFP process put up by uh, TL 2015, and uh, in that process. Uh, um, there's uh, specifics that are being asked around uh, the RFP process, Answer. and, and uh, I know the minister, uh, the minister responsible for uh, public safety, will be able to answer that piece of the question. Wow. Thank you. Thank you supplementary. So, uh, Speaker, this new revelation, revelation actually leaves us very concerned about what the real criteria is for awarding contracts for these games. Security costs keep going up. I mean, this is a fact. It's undeniable. And some people may be asking, what are these sponsorship uh, perks? Uh, the method of sponsorship can be cash, an in-kind contribution, or marketing activation value. So people are asking, and these are good questions, whether a company's sponsorship of the games bumped them up the list of bidders, even though it may have added to the cost in the long run. 
Speaker, in the interest of being open and transparent, will the minister just release the full criteria of how these, cr these contracts are being awarded? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I'll take the question. Um, uh, during the, uh, in the RFP process, uh, as outlined by TO 2015 in coordination with the ISU, which is made up of the provincial, federal and municipal partners, uh, sponsorship, uh, a sponsorship is one of the criteria within the RFP, but this is quite common uh, in all games, uh, Vancouver Olympics, uh, the last Pan Am Games, and I have to say the sponsorship to these games are so important. In fact, our sponsorship here in Ontario for the Pan Am Games are the largest sponsorship ever in the history of the Games, and in fact, Mr. Speaker, wow. it's five times larger than what happened uh, in Mexico uh, back uh, at the last Pan Am Games. So these games are, suc are, are successful; they're on time, and um, we will make sure we will make sure that people in Ontario yes, are safe uh, during these games. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. As a public health nurse during the SARS outbreak in 2003, I know firsthand the importance of proper infection controls. I was the manager responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the York Region SARS Clinic. Scarborough Hospital Birchmont Campus is located in my riding of Scarborough Aging Court. It was the first hospital in Ontario to encounter SARS. This hospital was considered the epic center for SARS, and during the outbreak, more than 100 staff became ill with SARS. Hence, the residents in my riding of Scarborough Aging Court are particularly interested in knowing our government's plan in ensuring the province's readiness in dealing with Ebola. Ontario needs to take action to ensure the province's readiness to contain and treat any potential case of Ebola in the province. Measures need to be placed to protect the safety of all Ontarians, Question. including the health care workers. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the government doing to ensure all Ontarians are protected and a health care system is prepared for Ebola? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you, first of all, from one healthcare professional to another for the question. And uh, I want to start, in fact, by giving my sincere thanks to the thousands of frontline healthcare workers right, ac right across this province who not only do fantastic work every day, but particularly when it comes to our protection against Ebola and the epidemic that's occurring in another part of the world. I want to thank them for the work that they do in making sure that Ontarians are safe and protected. And Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to say as well that as a result of our frontline health care workers, particularly our nurses coming forward uh, last week, that we introduced further measures to further strengthen the protections that are in place in this province. Uh, I announced that we uh, had designated 10 hospitals, two pediatric and eight for adults across the province. As well, as of yesterday, we have the capacity uh, in province to test for Ebola. We'll be doing that on a case-by-case -case basis. And we've introduced other measures which will guarantee what is, in fact, my top priority, and that is the safety and security of Ontarians. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'm very pleased to hear the necessary action taken by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. I know the residents in my riding are sure that our province has a minister who listens and takes timely action for the safety of all Ontarians. But day to day, Mr. Speaker, we continue to hear the tragedies in West Africa with the Ebola outbreak. The current Ebola outbreak, which began in West Africa in March 2014, is unprecedented. The World Health Organization declared Ebola as a public health emergency of international concern on August 8, 2014. I know many Ontarians, including my riding, are concerned about the rapid spread of Ebola virus in West Africa. Speaker, through you to the Minister, how can Question. we support the emergency response in West Africa? Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you again for the question, Mr. Speaker. I want to say, on behalf of all Ontarians, our gra how, just how grateful we are for the hard work, the dedication, and the courage of our relief workers, our health care workers, our aid workers that are working in West Africa to put an end to this epidemic. Many of these health care workers, in fact, are coming from Ontario. The Premier and I had the privilege yesterday of to meet and discuss the epidemic in West Africa with representatives from Doctors Without Borders, Médecins Sans Frontières, as well as uh, the Red Cross here in Canada, who have deployed a significant number of uh, health care specialists to the region. Uh, it's a devastating situation, as we all know, uh, but we were uh, happy on behalf of Ontarians to announce yesterday, the Premier announced a $3 million contribution from Answer. Ontario to not only focus on prevention here in the province and making sure that we're prepared, but to be part of the solution there as well to end this epidemic and this scourge. Thank you. Your question, the member from Wellington, how you 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Will the Premier guarantee that the $224 million loan her government gave to Mars Phase 2 office tower will be repaid in full? Thank you, Mr. Premier. Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Sir, sure. Economic yes. Development, uh, Employment and Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, we've been very clear. Uh, the loan is fully secured on the value of the asset, and the asset is more than uh, uh, more than the uh, amount that we've invested. It's a fairly simple answer. But, Mr. Speaker, I, I think it's important at this time to start talking a little bit about the lack of support that we've seen from the PC party for the Mars vision. I think what they've done is they've, they've indicated that when Mars was having challenges, their position was to let that building rot in the ground. So I asked the member in his supplementary, will he commit to, to supporting the efforts we've made to help support Mars to ensure that Phase 2 succeeds, or is his party's position and was his party's position to let that, that project uh, rot in the ground, allow those jobs and all that economic development Answer. potential in our bioscience uh, sector to go out the window. Is that the position of your party? Thank you. Supplementary. It's instructive that the Premier did not guarantee that the Mars loan would be repaid. The Premier was elected on her promise to govern differently, to turn the page on Liberal scandals, to op be open and transparent with this House and with the people of Ontario. However, when it comes to the Mars money pit, They've been anything but open and transparent. At Estimates Committee last week, the minister responsible for Mars was evasive and dodgy. He refused to release the business case for the Mars loan and other relevant information related to the Mars bailout, even though taxpayers are now paying almost half a million dollars a month, a tab that now stands at $3.6 million. When will they keep their promise to be open and transparent and release the agreement with Alexandria Real Estate and the business case for the Mars bailout? Hey, hey, hey. Mr. Speaker, I don't know how more clear we can be. We've said it a thousand times. The loan is repayable. It will be repaid. It's fully secured, Mr. Speaker. Taxpayer dollars are well protected in this in this uh, arrangement, Mr. Speaker. I think what's causing concern in in the bioscience sector is the lack of support of the party opposite. That's taken every opportunity to besmirch the reputation of Mars. After Mars has created tens of thousands of jobs in this province, attracted three billion dollars of private sector investment in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. The vision of Ernie is in Jim. Flaherty, Mr. Speaker, has become a very important part of our economy. Answer. It's really a shame that the party opposite shows so little respect for that vision. Thank you. New question, the member from Grand Lake, Laura Martin. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On March 27th, this Premier indicated to Ontarians that she would, quote, open up the government completely. Yesterday, she repeated this promise, saying, quote, we are committed to being open and transparent. But the Premier has failed to say whether she will allow the gas committee to get back to work, to hear from additional witnesses before writing a final report. Today, the Premier can keep her promises to being open and to being transparent, or she can break her promise. Will the Premier do the right thing and allow the gas plant committee to resume its work and call any new witnesses that need to be heard? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Premier. The, the, the Premier cannot be clearer. She has been clear all throughout. One, she wanted to make sure that the, the committee has all the information available, well, and when no, she became the leader and the question. Premier, she provided hundreds of thousands of documents. She appeared before the committee, in fact, t twice uh, to answer any questions that the committee may have had. Uh, not to mention, during the campaign, when asked repeatedly, the Premier was very clear that it's time for the committee to write his report. And she was uh, merely actually echoing what the, the members of the third party themselves uh, have been asking for the member for Toronto Danforth on December the 12th said in the committee I believe it's time for us to get down to report writing we have amassed a large amount of evidence both oral and in electronic copy we agree speaker it is time for the committee to resume its work Answer. and write a report and give recommendations to the government thank you speaker yep. supplementary thank you very much mr. speaker some Liberals, including the member for Trinity Spadina, think there's a right time and a wrong time for openness and transparency. Clearly, the Premier is one of them. But new Democrats disagree. We believe the right time for openness and transparency is all the time, every day, day in, day out, without fail and without excuse. 
The government isn't, isn't just preventing a committee from com completing its work. The Liberals are also sitting on the Orange Report, which is printed and ready to be tabled. I'm going to give the Premier another chance to keep her promise. Will the, will the Premier commit to tabling the Orange Report, and if not, why not? Hey, speaker, I ask the member opposite the following question. Does he stand by his motion of April 29, where he moved he that the Standing question. Committee on Justice Policy begin report writing in open session? Does he believe? Does he stand by the own motion that he put forward in the Justice Committee? Speaker, we are we have been extremely transparent. We want uh, the committee to resume its work as soon as it can and start the work of report writing as it has been asked by the third uh, party and and same uh, with a uh, speaker with the with the orange uh, uh, committee report is up to the standing committee of public accounts that's why speaker in july when we said right after the election we worked so hard to make sure that we've got committees established so as soon as we come back in the fall as we did starting yesterday the committees can continue to that's start right. their work and do the work of the people thank you very much thank you no question the member from ajax pickering Mr. Speaker, as a strong supporter of public libraries, I want to let the members of the House know that this week is Ontario Public Library Week. Ontario's public libraries are among the best in the world, and they are popular hubs for community life. There are more than 1,100 libraries throughout Ontario, and they attract over 72 million people every year. Over 5 million Ontarians, that's 40 per cent of the population, have a library card. Libraries open up the world to knowledge. They connect us to the information and resources we need to succeed in life and school and our jobs. In many communities, libraries ensure that recent immigrants to Canada are welcomed and have access to information and resources Question. that help them to adjust life in the new country. Libraries often offer newcomer information services, provide free help for people looking for a major job, housing, learning English, finding a school, getting a driver's license. Thank you. And other <clears throat> Sorry. Minister. Who wrote this? I'd like to uh, thank the distinguished member from Ajax Pickering for the Very question. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, libraries uh, hold a very special place in, uh, in my heart, and I'm very proud to, uh, to, to, to take on libraries as part of my portfolio. We know that libraries help children learn. They provide resources for students and small businesses and entrepreneurs, and they make an important contribution to the education, literacy, and lifelong learning for all people across, uh, across this great province. And that's why we're so proud as a government to invest $33 million in 2013-14 into our public and uh, First Nation libraries here in the province Very of Ontario. Fun. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, since 2003, this government's invested almost half a billion dollars Answer. into our public libraries. And Mr. Speaker, we know also that the Trillium Foundation has invested over half a million dollars into our public libraries this year, and we're very proud for the work our libraries do here in Ontario. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for telling us the no and all the government supports the libraries here in Ontario. As we all know, we live in a digital world. Everything is moving online and into digital formats. Our libraries are doing a fantastic job at evolving with technology and bringing that technology to the communities, including Ajax and Pickering. In the 2014 budget, I was happy to hear that your ministry is supporting libraries in these efforts through the Library Capacity Fund to help boost digital services, and I'm happy our government is committed to making services in public libraries across the province even better. Speaker, Question. could the minister please tell the members of this House about the Ontario Library Fund that he announced yesterday? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Welcome, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yesterday, I was happy to announce the Ontario Library Capacity Fund at Parkdale Public Library. Wow. And Parkdale. through this new fund, Mr. Speaker, our government is going to invest an additional $10 million into our public libraries here in Ontario over the next three years to support the following. Improvements in high-speed internet access throughout Ontario. We're going to increase wireless access. We're going to upgrade hardware and software in our, in our uh, libraries. It'll go to staff development, collection development, enhance uh, integrated library services, and also enhance our public library websites uh, in Ontario. 
Uh, this fund is, is a three-year fund, and the first year will focus on IT improvements. In the second and third year, uh, libraries will be eligible for research and innovation uh, funding. Our government believes that access to online services is essential in today's knowledge-based economy, and I'm happy that we're supporting these goals through yes, this new fund, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Wow. Any question? Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Attorney General. Minister, you ordered budget cuts to victim services across Ontario and by as much as 20 per cent in my riding of Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. As a result, this regional group of 50 volunteers and only seven staff who cover 11,000 square kilometres day and night and who helped over 2,500 victims of crime last year will be left with a pittance of a budget. A budget so small it falls $60,000 short of the one they started with 16 years ago in 1998. This is a direct attack on public services. Yep. Minister, will you reconsider your cuts to this critical service? Thank you, Attorney General. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, for the question. Yes, indeed, we are modernizing uh, uh, our uh, victim services uh, program to provide and end support to victims of crimes. So, beginning in April uh, 2015, this program will be delivered under a new program called Victim Crisis Assistance Ontario. In addition to existing services, vulnerable victims will receive enhanced support, including comprehensive needs assessment. Service plan tailored to individual victim needs will help them navigate and access short and longer term support services. So, in order to make the program consistent across the province, comprehensive program standard accountability measure and standardized training requirement for staff and volunteer will be developed. Right, so these change build on our commitment to providing timely and effective services for victims of crime. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, again to the Attorney General, is modernizing a code word for Downsizing Minister, your government is leaving behind victims of sexual assault and people living in violent conditions. I have serious concerns with the priorities of this minister and this government, and the House should too. You are wasting millions of dollars to build out empty offices in downtown Toronto, known as Mars, while gutting millions in community-based services for victims of crime. Minister, again, will you make this right and reinstate compensation and services for victims of crime? It's all about the victims. Mr. Speaker, we are not redu reducing funding to any of these programs. Instead, current funding for the three program is being redirected to a single program. And yes, we have review now. We are paying for the service that is being offered for the client that this organization will serve. So there is a reorganization, there is a, a repurposing of uh, the dollar, and the dollar are being redirect to a single program, as I said. At uh, the same time, we are implementing a more equitable and transparent funding model by aligning funding with service demand. That means each agency delivering the program will receive a base funding amount and a variable amount based on the number and type of victim serves. Answer. So, and to uh, to answer the, uh, the the member, we are providing more money to the northern uh, community and to the rural community. Sure. So we thank are. You. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, earlier this year, Metrolinx proposed a plan to allow eight giant digital LED billboards on Metrolinx property along Highway 401. Last week, the Toronto Paramedic Association warned that the scheme would, quotes, place us all at greater risk of death and injury, unquote. Uh, Mr. Speaker, when a driver's attention is focused on a billboard, it is not focused on the highway. Metrolink should be in the business of safe travel, not making money from driver distraction. On a day when the Minister of Transportation is announcing legislation to stop distracted driving, will he listen to the paramedics and instruct Metrolinks to drop this dangerous and distracting billboard scheme? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member for Parkdale High Park for this uh, particular question. I've uh, had the opportunity to review the letter that she referenced in the question from the Toronto Paramedic Association. Of course, uh, Speaker, I take my responsibility to ensure that Ontario's roads remain amongst the safest in North America, and they have consistently been ranked first or second in terms of road safety over the last, uh, over the last 13 years. Speaker. 
I take that responsibility very, very seriously. It's one of the foundational aspects of the mandate letter that I received from the Premier. I do look forward to having to say a lot more a little bit later today about making, uh, making sure that, we, uh, that, those, that our roads and our highways remain safe. Speaker, I am listening to all of the interested stakeholders, to the municipality, and of course, I'm talking to Metrolinx regularly about this and a variety of issues. Speaker, thank you very much. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, earlier this year, Metrolinx also spent buckets of money on several TV ads for transit projects that won't even be operational for seven months, several months, or even several years. These ads didn't provide any useful information, and one TV spot for the Union Pearson Express was so ridiculously self-congratulatory that Metrolinx had to pull it off YouTube out of embarrassment. Who knows how much money was wasted? Mr. Speaker, Sometimes I can't tell if Metrolinx is a transit planner or an advertising agency. If Metrolinx needs money, it doesn't need billboards. Will the Minister of Transportation tell the mad men of Metrolinx to get out of the billboard business and get back to the business of transit? Minister of Transportation. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the supplementary question from the member from Parkdale High Park. I think it's important for me to say as clearly as I possibly can, Speaker, I have a great deal of faith in the tremendous work that's taken place and will continue to take place at Metrolinx. We have a very ambitious, exciting plan about moving Ontario forward. Of course, members like the member opposite would have heard us speak repeatedly about the importance of our Moving Ontario Forward plan. Over the next 10 years, Speaker, we will be investing $15 billion, up to $15 billion in the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area, specifically benefiting residents living in Parkdale High Park, living in communities like mine of Vaughan, people living right across the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area. And Metrolinx is playing a very crucial role with, res with respect to the planning and the implementation of that plan, Speaker. I look forward over the coming months to be uh, here in this place and elsewhere. Uh, continuing on with the great work that we have at hand, Speaker, and I know that the people of the GTHA and the people of all of Ontario expect us to deliver the positive results that they've given us the mandate to deliver. Thanks very much. Thank you. Any question? The member from Trinity Spadina. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the uh, Deputy Premier and Minister responsible for poverty reduction strategy. As of 2011, there were more than 1.5 million people living in poverty in Ontario. That's not okay in a province as strong as ours. Poverty should be no one's destiny, and we must come together as a province to ensure that everyone has the opportunity for a better future. In order for all our people in Ontario to reach their full potential, we need to make sure everyone has the support that they need to succeed. Last Friday, communities around the world observed the International Day to Eradicate Question. Poverty. The, the occasion gave us a chance to reflect on how far we've come as a province to improve the opportunity for vulnerable citizens. Mr. Minister, what is Ontario doing to fight poverty and thank better you. support the people that need our help? Thank you, Minister responsible for poverty well, thank and you, Speaker, strategy. Thank you to the member from Trinity Spadina for uh, the question and for recognizing International Day to Eradicate Poverty. Speaker, we've made steady progress since we introduced Ontario's first poverty reduction strategy in 2008. According to the most recent data, Speaker, 47,000 children and their families have been lifted out of poverty, and, and we've prevented tens of thousands of others from falling into poverty. Speaker, in 2003, a single mom with two kids working full-time at a minimum wage job had an income of less than $20,000 a year. Today, as a result of the effort, our efforts, Speaker, that mom has an annual income of almost Answer. thirty-five thousand dollars. Wow. A huge difference for that family. But there's more to do, Speaker, and that's why we've uh, introduced our second poverty reduction strategy, really realizing our potential. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you to the Deputy Premier for that response, Mr. Speaker. Homelessness is often the most visible face of poverty in our community particularly in the large cities like Toronto. Our people are our greatest resource as we can compete in this increasingly tough global marketplace. That is why investing investments in housing and supports that goes with them are smart investments. A place to call home 
provides a stable foundation that helps people lift themselves out of poverty. When people have a home, they are better able to manage the challenges in their lives and to seek education and training that they need to move forward and for better, for better opportunities and stable and rewarding employment. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Deputy Premier, how will the new poverty reduction strategy deal with the challenges Question. of homelessness? Okay. Well, Minister. thank you, Speaker. And as part of our new strategy, we have set a long-term goal to end chronic homelessness in Ontario. Ending homelessness is not only the right thing to do, Speaker, it's a smart thing to do because we know that investments in housing actually means savings in our health care system and other parts of our social services, Speaker, because people are healthier and they're more ready for employment and taking part in their community. Our strategy includes several commitments that will help us work toward that goal, increasing the uh, funding of our, uh, the CHIPI program, Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative, for a total of nearly $294 million a year. Speaking, speaker, we're adding an additional 1,000 supportive housing spaces Answer. for people with mental health, health and addiction challenges. We're investing $50 million in a local poverty reduction fund to support local solutions to poverty. We've set ambitious goals, Speaker, but we're on our way to achieving Thank them. Thank you. New question. The member from Melbourne, New South Wales. Thank you, Speaker. My speaker is to the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister, a few weeks ago, you made a major announcement in my riding concerning the overcrowding at Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre. Overcrowding that this Liberal government has ignored for the past three years has led to numerous deaths and daily violence at the facility. Shameful. Minister, your ministry's track record is terrible when it comes to fixing the problems at EMDC. Your ministry closed rural jails, which amplified the overcrowding conditions, failed on the implementation of the 12-point plan to fix the jail, and failed in providing correctional officers with the proper equipment to do their jobs. So, Minister, forgive me if I'm sounding a little skeptical on this announcement, but there's a very short time period for a new build. I am unable to find the numbers in this year's budget for this build. So, Minister, would you be able to share the budget for the project, where this money will come from, and when the RFP will be released? Thank you very much, Speaker. And I, I thank the member uh, opposite uh, for the for the question and and his uh, his uh, work and advocacy on issues around uh, Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre. As the member uh, opposite mentioned, I had a, a great visit on October the 8th uh, to EMDC. Uh, I was uh, joined, uh, Speaker. Uh, I was joint speaker with uh, uh, with our our management, uh, the hardworking correctional staff, both correctional officers and and, and managers, uh, along uh, with the labor leaders, uh, both locally and, and and provincially. And speaker, I was really struck by the professionalism of our correctional staff, both management and correctional officers. How work they work, hard they work, and how dedicated speaker they are to the well-being and the safety of the community. And I spent about three and a half hours touring. Uh, touring the, uh, yes, the facility and, and talking to as many correctional officers and thanking them for the work they do every single day in keeping our community and safe. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. I, I, I'm sure uh, the Minister will answer the question in the after the Supplementary. Uh, Minister, I've drawn attention to these issues at the MDC in this chamber for three years, yet uh, your government has taken little action to correct these uh, areas of concerns. The violence and deaths continue. Most recently, I have written you requesting the government utilize uh, their assets to find a solution for EMDC. For example, the government could utilize the regional mental health buildings in St. Thomas and create a partnership with the Southwest Centre for Rent Forensic Mental Health Care for shared services. Or the government could simply reopen the Blue Water Youth Detention Centre in Goddard that your government recently closed. Good idea. Minister, have you completed a cost analysis on a new build compared to using the existing government assets? Good question. Uh, speaker, speaker, I thank the member for the supplementary. Speaker, we're very much focused on dealing with uh, issues around uh, uh, overcrowding and ensuring uh, the health and safety of our, our correctional staff and uh, the safety of the inmates. And that's why, Speaker, I want to give credit to my predecessor, uh, the Attorney General, when she was the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Uh, she put in uh, in, in plan a 12-point action plan. 11 out of those, uh, 12 of those uh, uh, action plan items have been fully implemented. But 
Speaker, we're not stopping there. We are taking steps uh, in uh, in making sure that uh, we have issued a procurement, uh, a request for proposal for a regional intermittent centre, uh, which will allow for uh, for uh, uh, separating the intermittent inmates from those inmates who are uh, are are spending uh, their sentence in, in entirety at the detention centre. It's going to also uh, not only resolve the issue, Speaker, on overcapacity, but it's also going to help us in dealing with contraband issues. Yes, Further, Speaker, we're also rolling out the personal protective safety equipment for our correctional officers, so their, their health and safety is uh, a, a number one priority for, for our government and remains Thank paramount. You. Speaker. Question the member from uh, to Ms. Kami, uh, from no, Timmons Tim James, James Bay. Bay, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, a few years ago, your government decided to shut down access to a number of provincial parks. As a result, Fushimi Provincial Park, the uh, Rennie Brunel Provincial Park, and Ivanhoe was going to be closed to both day and seasonal campers. Northerners came to the, c c decided to come up to their own solution. We put together a solution. Local residents, along with the uh, mayors of the area and myself and Mr. Vantoff and others, to put together a proposal that allowed those parks to stay open. The parks for the last two years have made money. The pilot project has been successful, but you have yet to make a decision if you're going to renew that agreement or not. You know as well as I do, if you don't renew the agreement soon, people are going to move and they're going to go elsewhere, making those parks less profitable. Minister, when can we expect a response from you in regards to the renewal of this agreement? Thank you. Minister, Minister, Minister. Speaker, thank you very much, and I'm pleased to take the question, and I can't help but comment, Speaker, on your new look. Uh, you're reminding me of the 1970s Oakland Athletics and Roly Fingers, the old pitcher for the, <laughs> with, the, with the mustache. But to the member's question, I want to thank him for this, and uh, it is topical and timely. As he's mentioned, in 2012, a decision was made to take 10 uh, that were operating parks, uh, most, if not all of them, I think, save it, and except for one that were in Northern Ontario, and make them non-operating parks. And I do, like the member did in his question, want to thank the communities of Moonbeam, Hearst, Timmins, surrounding communities, and the municipal councils, and the surrounding broader community who did step up to the plate, work very closely with our government and former ministers in coming forward with a plan. I think it's fair to say that it was through their efforts that the two-year pilot was established. The information and the data is now coming back to us. We've had an opportunity to review that data, and we will be in a position to make a decision very, very soon. I'll be happy to publicly communicate that position uh, to the member very, very soon. We're close. The data's in. We're reviewing it, and we will make a decision and an announcement Answer. in the very near future. Speaker, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Minister, what part of success don't you like? The Northerners rose to the occasion. They said, we'll find a solution. We found a solution that allowed the parks to stay open and to create a profit. The issue here is, and the Premier is making fun of it because she doesn't understand Northern Ontario, and we know that, but here it is. People who have seasonal campers need to know that they've got a place to go this spring. If you delay the decision as to the reopening of the parks till sometime later in January, February, they will lose their spots what, that are going to be available in other parks. So we need to have an answer soon, not later. So I'm going to ask the, pre the minister again, will you please stand up for Northern Ontario and say, yes, we will reopen those parks next spring? Thank you. Minister. Premier, er, sorry, Premier. Speaker, most of the question was pretty good, but for the member opposite to say that this Premier does not understand Northern Ontario is a pretty remarkable statement. There's wow. no Premier that we've ever had, I don't think, that gets Northern Ontario better. And I want to... So much of the good work that we've been able to do as Northern members is due directly to the consideration that she gives to Northern, to Northern members. Speaker, as I said, there are processes underway now. I don't want to presuppose the results of that work that is ongoing. We will be in a position very, very soon to make an announcement. It's my hope that the announcement will be something that's accept uh, acceptable to the communities. Again, I'll close by thanking the members uh, for the work, the communities, the mayors, and the surrounding areas. We'll Thanks, be sir. announcing thank something you. very, very soon. Thank you. Question? The member from Mississauga Streetsville. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, this question is to the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister, what pollution was in the 1960s and 70s, and civil and women's rights were in the 1970s and 80s, 
climate change is today. It is the defining issue of our time. It it's the 21st century's challenge to governments, industry, communities, and individuals. In its fifth assessment report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded there is an overwhelming scientific consensus that Earth's climate system is warming and that human activities are mainly responsible for this change. Ontario has delivered cleaner air and significantly lowered carbon dioxide emissions through no longer burning coal to generate electricity. Minister, what else is Ontario doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to fight climate change? Thank you. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, Ontario is one of a handful of jurisdictions in the world that actually has got its greenhouse gas emissions under 1990 levels. As a matter of fact, we joined uh, in New York uh, to release our report that we bettered our, our uh, our 6% goal, we will exceed it. We'll be the only jurisdiction that will likely exceed its targets, I think probably in the world, maybe Germany. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we're heading not for the two degrees dangerous, but we're now heading for four degrees dangerous. Four degrees would mean my, my four-year-old grandson probably will grow up in a world where life will be difficult, food will be hard to get. That's not a legacy I'm prepared to leave him, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Climate change is the single biggest threat to humanity. Yes, sir. Our failure to achieve it, uh, a successful global action plan in the next year, will leave our children an unthinkable legacy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. Minister, failing to act on climate change will bring harm in the form of preventable extreme weather to our communities and to our economy. And there's the challenge. Climate change doesn't recognize borders or jurisdictions, nor can it be overcome by a single ministry or a single government. From saving species like Canada's polar bears from extinction to saving coastal populated areas by preventing coastal flooding, how is Ontario continuing to lead and to be successful in the world's continuing fight against climate change? Thank you. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, be, just before I, I get into the details of that, I just want to make it very clear, climate change is not something that is going to come tomorrow or the next day. We are now experiencing the level, the impacts of CO2 emissions from when I was in high school in the 70s, and we are now locked in to 100 years of change. You're going to start seeing the impacts of climate change in the next winter. California's in the most severe drought situation it has ever been in. That's about one-third of North America's food supply. They are now draining aquifers, which is non-renewable water, and when I met with Governor Brown in New York, they are very, very concerned. We saw it here in Ontario, in Lake Erie, when Toledo, 400,000 people, couldn't use their water because a warming lake and new patterns of rain pushed more nutrients into that lake, and 400,000 people could not drink water because of the toxins. You could not boil it. Now, I was going to suggest that if yes, that sir. happened in Fort Erie, this would be a front-page news story. This is the sleeping issue of our time. There is no more important issue. As Secretary Kerry said in New York— Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No, we can't. Uh, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs on a point of order. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I just want to correct my record from yesterday. Uh, Hansard uh, said that the uh, GDP contribution for the agri-food sector in Ontario's reported was $30 billion. It's actually $34 billion in GDP. Wow. Hansard said uh, the number of people employed in the agri-food sector is 74,000. The actual number is 760,000 Ontarians in that sector. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, member always has, or all members have a right to correct their record as long as they're not changing what was said. They, that's, uh, I just point that out. Just relax. The member from Leeds, Grenville, on a point of order. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I just want to welcome uh, one of my uh, constituents who's here for IPF awareness. Uh, Jackie Bowick Sandor is here in the gallery. Welcome to Queen's Park. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.